All right, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this uh, new webinar with Built Oregon and how to start a open conversation with your landlord, build an owner, and given the current circumstances that we're dealing with right now, we are dealing with unprecedented times, especially for business owners, uh, waiting for payroll assistance for the federal local offices, and but also they have the Lease, commercial leases on their um they're working um they're working on and they're still accruing on and had to pay for their to keep the business afloat so we invited uh a great panel of experts that will be joining us uh to help answer your questions uh we have del del medina she's supporting founders uh from different aspects from the bay area black and brown founders she's gonna join us and then in the second part of the of the panel, we have Blake uh, Saint Ange uh, from Commercial. He's a commercial real estate broker here in Oregon. Uh, Aaron Holloway for Perkins Coie. Uh, he's going to provide us with uh, the point of view from the legal aspect. And Michelle Reeves, uh, she's known for her work um, around the country and work in the mainstream re revitalization and founder. Uh, founder of Sibylis Consultant. So with that, uh, Blake, Aaron, and Michelle, could you just give us a quick intro what you do and what your expertise? Uh, we allow Aaron and Del Del to join us in a little bit of video. Blake, you wanna kick us off? Sure, sure. Uh, Blake St. Ange, I am a principal and co-leader of the Cressa Portland office here in Portland. I've uh, been in the business for about 14 years, and I uh, advise tenants of all shapes and sizes and on uh, uh, real estate strategy. Um, right now, it's been a lot of tactical implementation of what to do uh, when the April rent is due. Um, so uh, my focus is, is working with occupiers and tenants on on uh, uh, full life cycle uh, real estate strategy. Okay, excellent. Welcome, Michelle. Welcome. Uh, Thank you for being here. About uh, 20 years of experience working on a mix of different things around economic development. So a lot of work working with property owners and kind of soup to nuts development consulting, small business consulting, and then also looking at the public sector toolkit and what they can do to accelerate economic activity in commercial districts around the country. Okay, thank you. Thank you for making time today. Aaron, uh, welcome. Uh, could you give us a quick intro of your expertise and where you focus in your practice law? Hopefully Aaron can hear us. There we go. Hi, Aaron. And we know technology is great when it works and sometimes it's not, uh, doesn't help us very well. Aaron, can you hear us? Okay. So while we're waiting for Aaron, um, and yeah, I know we love technology, it's great. So let's start a conversation. Uh, right now, what is on top of mind of many business owners is how do I keep my business afloat? How do I keep my business afloat? And one part is how do I get enough cash to pay for expenses, uh, payroll, but the other part is how do I pay the, the rent or the lease on my restaurant, my office? Uh, could you give us a quick overview, Michelle, of what you're seeing uh, with business owners? And I know you are an entrepreneur, but also a commercial, um, uh, you own buildings and have, have tenants that you're working with. What are you seeing so far? So I, I think it's uh, it's pretty brutal out there. And there are a lot of people who are either required to be closed because they're not an essential business uh, or are closed because their business does not translate easily into being a delivery or a pickup or a, a takeout business. Or we see um, smaller businesses that have had a pretty significant decrease in sales and they've had to lay off some of their employees. All of those situations are a little bit different in terms of dealing with your landlord. Um, and I think there are some key things that every tenant has to think about sort of out of the gate. So the first is don't wait for your landlord to contact you. You need to proactively get in touch with your landlord and you need to, need to let them know what is happening with you. 
The second thing, and I, I've seen a lot of these emails, do not send a 12-page sob story of every detail of all the terrible things that are happening to you. You need to really keep it to numbers and to keep it just tight and, and focused on what's going on. So what I like to recommend that people do is really focus on the next month um, because we, we really don't know how long this is going to take and what's going to be going on in three or four months. So really just focus on what you need with your property owner for the next month. If you have some sales, then you can propose some rent that is equivalent um, to what you would reasonably pay based on your sales. So if you have no sales, I think it's entirely reasonable to say to your property owner, look, right now I have no money coming in. I'm looking on how to retool, how to do some different things. But until then, I need a rent abatement for this very next month. If you're at 50% sales, then you ask for 50% um, off your rent, that kind of thing. So do not be afraid. You know, this is a negotiation and the rules of negotiating are the person who defines the box you're negotiating in first um, tends to do best. So don't, I, I think that tenants tend to have this concept of like, I need to be as reasonable as I can. And, and you need to protect yourself as much as you can right now. So you need to preserve cash. If, if you're not making anything in terms of sales and you need to ask for a full on rent abatement, the worst they can do is say no. And then you're kind of negotiating from there. So I really like to work backwards from reality, from numbers, um, and really make sure that you're being proactive in, in working with your landlord. And this is a little bit of a litmus test to see how they're going to respond. This is not just a, I think the last thing I would say is Portland, um, we're negotiating weenies. So we are like the home of split it down the middle. That's what we think negotiating is, is one round, split down the middle. This is a really tough situation. And so this isn't a one round and split it down the middle. This is a you ask for what you need and you define that negotiating box. And then your landlord is going to come back with something different. And you're going to have a bunch of rounds. And you know what? Every month you're going to be having these conversations until we're out of this. So you got to kind of get used to the fact that this is going to be an ongoing and, and um, fluctuating negotiation that's going to happen once a month for a while now. Oh, great. Um and the other part of the equation is the building owners. Uh, they have their mortgages, the utilities. Blake, what are you seeing in your end with um, with the people you work with? And you have a you have to negotiate leases they are due right now, and then negotiating with current tenants. So what what is the perspective from them? Yeah, I think a big a big piece. I think to, to Michelle's point, I, I think you have to focus on on the numbers piece of it. I think before you. Before you approach a landlord, I do think it's important to put a, 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 a business case together of what you have done, uh, what's how you've been impacted, uh, whether it be year to date or year over year, what your sales have been, what revenues have been, what your service lines might be. Um, can you, uh, you know, focus on some other other areas? I mean, I've got, you know, we work with clients that are entrepreneurs that have, you know, warehouse space and retail spaces as well. And the retail is pretty much all gone. They've had to lay off their hourly workers. They've had to lay off baristas. They've had to lay off their, you know, some of their restaurant staff. And so I think it's important when you approach a landlord to, to put a business case together of what impact it's had on you, on your business. If you're a business owner, um, what have you had to do? Not only layoffs, you've had no sales. Maybe you've taken a pay cut. Maybe you take, there's no pay. There's no revenue coming in. Because these the, the landlords, most landlords are going to have, uh, they, they've got loans on, on their assets. And so if you put together a case of rent relief, whether it be rent deferral, rent abatement, whatever the, whatever the function is, they then can take that and, and approach their lender in the same fashion and say, look, you know, the mortgage is coming due this month, et cetera, but we've got one tenant, two tenants, five tenants, whatever the tenancy might be in that asset um, that they then can take to their lenders. Cause they, they do, they've got, you know, they've got expenses as well. They've got mortgage, they've got taxes, they've got insurance, they've got camp, they've got other things that they have to pay too. I think, a hundred percent of of the business that we do, my firm is is occupier focused, tenant focused purely. Uh, the interesting thing in this, what we're going through in the with the pandemic is you have to figure out a way to partner and figure out a a, a, a reasonable solution here. And I think Michelle, to your point too, if you're a business owner, you're really good at 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 building your business. I think there's a there's a little bit of trepidation, I think, um, of how to position yourself and, and to negotiate. And I think a lot of times landlords too look at, well, maybe the tenant doesn't necessarily know what it's, what it's actually going to have to cost me if they leave. What's actually going to have to cost me, um, not just for the next two or three months, but to retenant the building. So I think putting together also 
you know, a case study to let the, to, to let the landlords know that you know what you're talking about. Meaning if I leave, you're gonna, it's going to take another six to nine months for you to retent the space. That new tenant that's, com that, that's coming in and is certainly, it may not be the, the same business or restaurant or retail or whatever the case might be that, I, that I'm in. So there's going to be costs allocated to that. There's a whole waterfall effect on that. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly an unwieldy time right now, but it's important to have open co communication, like Michelle said, early uh, and, and get those conversations going. Okay. Great, okay, thank you. And both of you guys mentioned about community, right? Our business owners, they try to figure out how to keep the lights on, stay afloat, stay, keep the doors open until we are true to that. The commercial uh, uh, buildings, the building owners, try to figure out how to fulfill their commitments. They'll, they'll, this is more like a community effort, how to take a community lens. What would you recommend uh, the approach to start the conversation? Because both ends are aching and hurting. So how we can come up, come with that approach as a community versus one versus the other. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate what Michelle said of so often folks are coming to this of like, we're gonna meet in the middle. Um, and I think like that's a great sentiment to have, but it's really important to understand who's sitting across the table from you and how to work with that person. I think that right now having folks that are uh, a part of your community, so whether that's you're a part of a local chamber of commerce or getting a hold of your city council person or getting a hold of your mayor or any other kind of institution that exists out there to find out what are the best practices that are happening, whether it's in the physical neighborhood that you're in um, or the communities that you work within is really important because everybody's being affected by this. Different people have different outcomes that are gonna come out of it, but it doesn't mean that you can't try to find some place to work uh, together rather than trying to be disparate. I think like, I just want to also acknowledge, like, uh, so it, the way that I think about it, this <laughs> might be a, a funny analogy, but it's like, you know, when you're like trying to figure out if you're going to break up with somebody or not, and you're like, oh, am I going to do this? That first email you write is not the email you send, right? Like that email is full of emotion. It is that full story that Michelle was talk talking about with all the nitty gritties and then this thing and that thing and then the other and then, you know, what this other thing. And you're like, that's not necessarily what the conversation needs to be. So I just want to acknowledge the fact that we're human beings. A lot of us are having folks that, have passed, that are passing away or have passed away in some way, shape or form. We're having some sort of PTSD. We're all being affected by it. It does not mean that you shouldn't acknowledge that. It also just means that you sometimes need to take a beat. And if that means that you need to sleep in late, since sleep in late, if it means that you need to take a day off, take a day off. But you can't be in a reactionary mood right now because what you're trying to do is set yourself up for not just success for the next 30 days, but hopefully for the next 60, 90 days, if possible. So it's really important just to take that breath and be able to say, okay, this is not the first email I'm going to send out. This might not even be the second email I'm gonna send out. I'm gonna find out what else other people are doing and then I'm gonna proceed from there. Because right now, if you're just acting on impulse and emotion, which is natural because we're human beings, it isn't necessarily gonna serve you well. So it's better for you to acknowledge those feelings and then move on from it. When we are thinking of the first action item, okay, so the email, uh, what are the, top three things that you need to align right now when you start a conversation with your landlord or builder owner, what are the top three things that you recommend people to have ready uh, to be able to answer those crucial questions? They are also relevant for the builder, builder owner to understand your circumstances. What would you start? Uh, start with Michelle. What would you recommend people, the three top things they need to have? So I think it's really important to break down where your revenue streams are now. So I like to break down, you know, let's say you're a small restaurant, you sell 15% wholesale grocery, 15% um, takeout, and then maybe the balance 70% is in restaurant service. So what you're gonna say to your landlord, here's how my sales for 2019 broke out in those three areas. And right now 70% 70, 70 of my sales are gone. And so I'm left with that 15% takeout, 15% grocery, and I'm gonna try and grow that. But for next month, I'm gonna be looking at 30% of my sales volume. So you kind of break it down by those pieces. And then you say, so for next month, what I wanna pay for rent is that 30%. And then you kind of do that calculation and you make that proposal. 
Um, and then the last thing that you want to do is you want to make your landlord feel like you are working very hard to get your hands on money to pay rent. Whether that's true or not is completely separate from what you're trying to represent to your landlord. You want your landlord to feel like you're doing everything possible to pay rent. So you want to explain what you're doing to build those revenue streams. And then you want to talk about the programmatic things that you're applying for. So you're applying for CARES, you're applying for Triple P, you're applying for the EIDLs, you're applying for the state and the, the local grants. And so saying when those things come in and when I, I um, uh, let's reconnect next month and look at where my sales are, where these different uh, benefit programs are coming in, and then I might have a different kind of rent picture. I have a little bit of a different take on um, how far out you want to go with property owners because I think there's a really wide range of emotions with property owners. So some property owners are in complete denial that this is going to impact their revenue stream. And with those people, I like to talk about next month and that's it. Because if you start talking about what's going to happen six to nine months from now, so, you know, the, those of us that work in the industry can tell you right now that every single landlord is going to be rewriting all their leases because people are not going to be at 2019 sales levels and they're not going to have the sales per square foot to be able to, uh, you know, pay the, the rent levels they were paying in 2019. In a lot of places, that is very likely to happen. But there are a lot of property owners that aren't ready for that conversation. So that's why you want to send off that first foray and you want to see where your landlord is. If they're really emotional and over leveraged and freaked out, just focus on next month and really assure them, here's what I'm doing to build sales. Here's where I'm trying to track down money to pay some more rent um, and make them feel like you got this and that you're working on this. Perfect. Blake, uh, from the property owner's perspective, what else could they people need to bring to the table and top of what Michelle already recommended. Yeah, I think that, you know, you, you, you open, like, a, like I said, you know, ha having your, your ducks in a row with, with um, uh, a checklist to sort of go through. And I think it's important that, I don't know, I, I think it's important to have right now uh, there's no precedence for this. And so I think s surrounding yourself with, people that you trust, um, that, that you can bounce ideas off of, I think is an important thing too. I mean, when all this stuff sort of came, came through a lot of people, uh, entrepreneurs are scrappy people. And so they're scrappy about, uh, they've got friends that they can do trades with to get some legal advice. They have friends that they can trade with to get some insurance advice. They have friends that are real estate people that to get advice. So I think it's important to surround. And right now in, in, I think in our view, it's a, it's an important time, um, uh, to build goodwill right now is a time to build goodwill uh, among uh, property owners, among tenants, among community. It's a, that, that's what right now is. It's not to bill necessarily. It's not to send, Hey, yeah, thanks. You know, you spent, spent an hour on the phone talking to an attorney and he sends you, you know, or she sends you a uh, $300 bill, right? Like it's just right now is a time to, to build goodwill because as we come out of this, people are going to remember real estate works in cycles in 2008, 9, 10, 11, things were in dire straits. In the last, I mean, really in the last 10 years, markets in Portland from an office perspective have risen almost 40%. And so you start thinking about those things and you just, um, they're cyclical. So right now is an important time to, to build goodwill. And Juan, I know I didn't answer that question specifically because you asked me what the three things. So I think Michelle did a really nice job sort of outlining what that looks like. I appreciate it. And it's, it's a lot of perspective, right? Uh, yeah. DJ is mentioning that the fact that we include them both sides of the conversation, uh, it is it is super important. And it's okay, Blake, I'm going to rotate. I'm going to bring Aaron in yeah. to start answering some of the questions. So Aaron, uh, hang tight. We're going to bring you in because some questions are waiting for you, okay? Give me a second. And Del, Del, uh, in terms of the community building, uh, I think that what Blake was mentioning, that was we're on presenting times and building community. And at the end of the day, when we come out of this, we're going to remember who was there to help us and who was a true partner and who, who wasn't. Um, what else can we advise people? Because at the end of the day, beyond the business models and the revenues, we're dealing with humans, right? And that's a human element that makes our community great. What else would, would you recommend people to approach it on both sides of the, of the question? Yeah. I, I think it's important. I, I, I do think that the goodwill piece is huge. And I have seen how it's been played out, not just in the Bay Area where I'm located, but obviously in Oregon. You're organizing this because you want people to have 
access to information, but that this is playing out across the US. And I think like this is the opportunity for people to be able to say, I am here and I'm gonna help you out. So whether that's uh, folks changing their business models just slightly and actually working together to be able to buy goods and services from each other, uh, whether it means that you have never had an email list and now you're gonna like for, have your first email list. Um, so if you're a small business and you've never had an email list, this is the perfect time to do it. Um, start small, it doesn't have to be huge. If you're not very savvy with email lists, start an Instagram, because that's the place that you feel comfortable as a human being, use Instagram. But if it's Twitter, it's Twitter. Find the place in the lane that you feel comfortable and kind of like the tools that are out there and be able to gather that information and be able to engage people to figure out what your next steps are. I also, thank you, Michelle, for saying, you know, some people just can't think beyond the next 90 days. I want to acknowledge that that's true. I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur who's getting ready to launch her business. She's really excited and all of this has happened. And now she's like, I literally cannot think beyond 90 days. Um, and so that's where I played a part. And I said, okay, you can't play 90, you can't think beyond 90 days. Let me help you figure out beyond the 90 days. You concentrate on the 90 days of how you're gonna meet payroll and what your budget looks like and what all, what are you gonna cut back on? And I'll do some research for you and we'll figure out like where could you, how could you position yourself, you know, in June, July, August? right? Like where are things going to be? And let me do some research. And so I did some research for her some companies that maybe she could partner with and I sent it off her way. And that was like a really good balance between her having to take care of her immediate needs of the employees she has and the folks that she's working with and the partners she has. And also having somebody that has that, that doesn't have that emotional attachment because I'm not attached to the day to day of what she's doing. And I could just be like, Hey, let me just figure this out for you. And I sent her a spreadsheet with some potential partners. And I'm like, okay, if you don't have the energy to contact them, give me some materials, create an email list, uh, an email for me so that I can do it through your business. You'll own that and I'll contact them for you. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. Uh, but it's that sort of thinking where it's like, if you yourself can't do it, you have to be as creative as possible. And as, as, as um, you know, it's true, entrepreneurs are super, resourceful and thoughtful and um, and creative. And this is the moment to try to flex that muscle. But I also want to acknowledge when you have cortisol running through your body because you're under stress, when you are feeling under stress, part of your brain that helps you be creative literally does not work. It is completely shut down. And so if you're in a situation where you're like, I can't do the things I normally can, that's okay. And then ask for that help so that you can balance off of somebody else and you can have a back and forth that's just like that removes you from that feeling of like i have to figure this out on my own um because you really don't at this moment in time and you can reach out to people you can do i've seen people do lots of like zoom meetings where they're meeting and exchanging ideas they're positioning themselves in the center and saying this is my problem does anybody else have a problem like this how have you resolved it and being able to do those exchanges i think has been hugely valuable for folks well, Can I, I want to on. add on to that Sorry. just really, really quickly, because actually that um, circles back to, I think the last thing to think about <clears throat> on the tenant side, um, and actually on the property owner side a little bit too. So on the tenant side, when you're feeling really under siege, like maybe you have one of the asshole landlords who's not being co collaborative, um, reach out to other small tenants you know, and find out what language they're using and what their landlords are responding to. One of the ways that I motivate property owners when I'm doing economic development work is through peer pressure. And if every property owner is just working in their little vacuum of I need to get my 50%, you know, rent no matter what and trying to squeeze blood from a stone, um, one of the ways that you can motivate them is to say, hey, these five other property owners around you, um, here's what they're offering. And, and, and then again, like the worse they're behaving, just focus on next month. Um, and, and really keep it tight and focused. But I, I've really seen a lot of tenants who are feeling under the gun and every time they have to send that, that note off to a landlord who's being a jerk, um, you know, not only do you feel terrible while you're sending it off, you feel terrible while you're writing it, you feel terrible while you're waiting for the response and then you get the response and it's really awful. <laughs> and then you feel like worse and you think like I have to keep doing this. You yeah. know, this is not what small entrepreneurs are set up to do. So it's very helpful to talk to other tenants who have the same landlord or are near you um, just to find out what's going on and to understand that all you guys are in the same boat and you can also get language um, and, and just, 
you know, information is king in this position and understanding what other people are doing can be really helpful. Yeah. So Aaron, um, you, you, you put in the chat box, the communication is key, right? Uh, right now. Um, <laughs> one of the questions that we have from, uh, from the people that are listening right now is that they are one of several tenants that the landlord simply won't reply to. And they cannot, if they cannot afford rent due to revenue decline, uh, what, what they can do if the landlord is not responding, it is great that the governor has order, ordered there's no evictions for tenants, but the governor has a mandate negotiation. So what records do these uh, tenants have if the landlord doesn't want to negotiate? Yeah, at, at, at this time, you know, what, what we were telling all our clients, all our tenants is, like you said, the first step is communication. And if you've done that and if you've exercised as much as you can, whether it's pick up the phone, whether it's sending a written notice or whatever it may be, uh, landlords are not obligated to respond. Uh, and some landlords are not responding because they don't want anything on record. Uh, and that's their choice to do that. Um, but for tenants, I mean, all you can do is trying to build, try to uh, build that gap and try to just be open about what you can do. If the landlord's not responding, there's really, there's not much more you can do. You can't force the landlord to respond. And it may be strategic on their point, on their part of not responding just because they, would, they want to reserve their rights under the lease, which is understandable. Uh, but for tenants at this point, if if all you can do is try to be reasonable, be open of your situation. I think everyone has been saying the same thing about being consistent of explaining your difficulties, your challenges. If the landlord's not responding, then that's kind of where you're at. There's nothing more really that you can do besides reaching out as much as you can. And if the landlord's not looking to be reasonable, which is unfortunate in this environment, um, then all you can do at this point is continue to be uh, communicative, continue, continue to be responsive as far as where you at, where you are, and then that's the record that you're that you're pretty much maintaining for when when we're finally out of this. Um, we'll see what the landlord comes back with, but at least you have a record that look we've been we've tried to be reasonable as much as we as much as we can. We've let the landlord know of our difficulties, or our challenges that we're facing. Um, and the landlord refused to respond. We've, we've been reasonable, but the landlord has not been reasonable. Um, and that's all you can do. So it's, 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 it's unnerving. It's, uh, it's uh, stressful when you don't have a response back and you're trying to work this out. Uh, but at least you know on record that you've done what you, you're, you, you've done what you, you've can, what you, what you, what you can do. And from there, it's just, that's all you can do is just like, let that stress go. Cause there's nothing you can do. There's literally nothing you can do. And there's some, in fact, we've advised some landlord, our landlord clients to not respond in, some, in certain instances, uh, because strategically of having a, a, on the record of not, we don't want to be perceived as the landlord accepting, um, a, or waiving any of their rights or anything like that. So, that's, it may be strategic on their part, but all you can do on your end is be communicative, be open, be responsive. And if they don't respond, just have your record, have your email list, have all everything in order that if this does come up in the future, say, look, we've done everything that we could uh, to be open about a situation and you not pretty much turn that around and give us that same courtesy. Uh, and Juan, can I, uh, yes. can I add to that just a tiny bit? Just to say, um, I think a lot of people don't understand just from the small businesses that I'm talking to, what the commercial eviction moratorium is. So it's not a legal um, uh, reason, it, it's not a legal dismissal of paying rent. What it is, is that it right, says right. That legally the landlord cannot evict you for not paying rent. So technically under most commercial leases, um, if your rent is due either the fifth or the 10th, which is what's gonna be in most leases, the second you don't pay rent, under most leases, you're going to be in default. The landlord doesn't have to email you anything. He doesn't have to tell you anything. Under most right. commercial leases, the second you don't pay rent, you're in default. And traditionally, what that meant is the second you don't pay rent on the day that it's due, the landlord can lock you out. So the commercial eviction moratorium is meant to just stop the landlord from locking you out when you don't pay rent. But it doesn't dismiss you from your obligation to pay rent. And so that is what is really unclear. And I'll, I'll, I know that Aaron can lend more thought to this from a legal point of view. But what, um, what this means in a practical way for tenants is let's say you exercise um, uh, you, you know, your choice to not pay rent for April. Um, what's unclear is can your landlord still declare you in default and then try and evict you at the end of the commercial eviction moratorium? Even if you paid that April rent, as soon as the eviction moratorium was up, 
it's very unclear. That's a that we have no case law for that. And I talked to a favorite lawyer of mine, and he said a lot of lawyers are going to make a lot of money figuring out the answer to to that question. What's going to happen then? So you know, it is a stressful time. There are many tenants who should take advantage of not having to pay rent. If they have a landlord insisting they pay rent, they have nothing in sales and they have no savings, they should probably not be paying rent. But it is also unclear what is going to happen when the commercial eviction moratorium is up. As it stands now, it's entirely possible a landlord could say you're in default and, and boot you out. Um, if you showed up on that day with all your rent, then that's another question. And I, I think it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say yeah. about that from a legal perspective. Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely spot on. In fact, that the moratorium is just uh, is just a pause on the, the landlord's ability to go to court to have you evicted. Uh, courts are closed right now. I mean, I think I think I read that the Oregon uh, Civil Courts is closed after June. So no one can do anything right now. But that, that uncertainty works both ways and that the landlord also has uncertainty on their end uh, which is, it should give them some incentive to work with you as a tenant, because one, if 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 like you say, day one after everything is is over, and you know business picks back up, they have to stand in line with a whole ton of other landlords. So it's going to be months and months and months before they can get their case heard, which which should give them some incentive to say, you know what, it may be best for me to just work it out with this tenant, as opposed to trying to go to court, spending litigation costs spending more time to get a tenant out and then I have to put money in, put capital in to, to get the space back together, find a new tenant. I don't, where, where, where are you going to even gonna find a new tenant at in this, in this environment? So it may even be worthwhile for the landlord to, to use that uncertainty to the landlord to say, look, you can sue me. And I had some clients, some tenant clients that said, look, I don't have anything. So if you want to sue me, stand in line, good luck going to court and, and going through that entire process. Good luck. Or we can work this out. We can do some type of written negotiations on how we figure this out. That saves you time, saves you money, and it also that uncertainty doesn't also hurt you as well. Uh, but yeah, you're spot on as far as the, the moratorium prevents a landlord from going to court to evict you. Yes, they may have rights day one after the moratorium is lifted, but however, how, how long would that process be? If there's a ton of landlords, that could be months, and that's months of no cash flow, no income, that's litigation costs. You're, you're right, the lawyers will make money, but the landlord at the end of the day won't have any certainty either, and that's not that doesn't work for them as well. So I think the uncertainty goes both ways enough where it should be enough leverage and enough um, energy on both parties to work, try to work this out and find a way to work this out because this is not a this is not a one tenant issue. This is a pandemic affecting everyone that we have to find a way to try to work this out because. Okay. Uncertainty on both ends, which, which if we're going to. Um, okay, so we have a question right now. Um, the question is a little sidestepping. Side side uh, it's still about tenants, uh, but it's more about the apartment tenant. Can you can you share if Aaron um, step out? So can you? We'll, we'll say the question for Aaron, and we maybe we can answer it offline. They, uh, they want to know if there's uh, any laws in the county that can allow apartment tenants not to pay rent through this time. Um, they have missed. Uh, they have been missed. Uh, if it's legally needed to be paid back, and uh, how will affect their credit score? Um, oh, can you hear us, Aaron? Yep, I can. Hear you. Okay. So the question right now is uh, a little bit about uh, apartment uh, apartment tenants. They want to know if any county laws that they might be in place that allow apartment tenants not to pay rent through this time, and um, when that miss rent is legally needed to be paid back, uh, when they need to pay it back, and also how this is going to affect their credit score um, if they miss payments. Uh, is any verbiage they need to communicate to the landlords to be able to protect themselves uh, during this time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the same thing with commercial tenants as it is a residential uh to just communicate um and that's the it, it starts there uh, just because of just the unsettling time that we're in now uh just make sure you communicate as far as the credit uh i believe there's some not only federal but also some, some state laws that are getting passed uh to try to preserve any credit hits um but the issue is just the same thing as it is with commercial tenants that yes there's a moratorium on evictions but day one after evictions days 
you're you're faced with a few things. You're faced with a balance being owed day one, which with may have interest and late fee. Well, I think the late fee are being waived, but at least the the principal amount is owed day one. Um, and then at some point you have to pay that. And you're trying to figure out how do I knock this lump sum as well as pay my normal rent through the rest of the term. Um, so all that to say is that that's even more impetus as far as negotiating with your landlord as far as how can I take care of the lump sum rent as well as keep up with my other obligations without getting evicted, without impacting my credit. I don't think your credit will be harmed initially, but then again, what do you do? And that's the, un that's the uncertain part. What do you do? day one at the moratorium is lifted, you knock down this balance. And it may be a payment plan, it may be extending your lease, it may be amortizing the missed payments um, through, the, through the remainder of the lease. It could be a number of scenarios where you can negotiate and get into a payment plan and you're not in technical default, which hurts your credit. Uh, but the best way to, to avoid that is to try to come into some, some, time, some type of arrangement with the landlord, um, which won't get reported to your credit agency hurting your credit. Got it. Um, this lead is a perfect segue for a question from DJ and Gwen. Force majeure. Uh, any, what is your knowledge of it being applicable uh, for uh, or mentioned by tenants? And the second question is, uh, how important is for tenants to avoid promissory notes uh, in case that they are inclined to make that promissory note to pay rent in the future so let's tackle yeah. first force majeure and yeah. then what about promissory notes to pay rent when things are starting to get better so force majeure is the legal concept that says that if some generally speaking if some unreasonable event happens that your obligations are pretty much suspended that's the general con that's the general very high level general concept uh but it's all contractual so your, if your lease contains that from a commercial perspective or even a tenant perspective, and it's on a case by case basis, you have to make sure that, hey, does the force majeure account for, you know, a pandemic, a virus or something that, to that effect, or at least some type of catch all language that gives you that basis to say, hey, my obligations are paused. On top of that, some force majeure language that says that everything could be suspended, but the rent. So it could be a force majeure for anything, but the rent is still due. So these force majeure clauses are contractual clauses that vary per lease. Some lease has have the, have these clauses. Other leases do not. Some leases have you know different variations of what what suspends your obligation and on what basis or what act of God uh, qualifies to suspend your obligations. So it's definitely is no real definite definition because everyone each one d differs based off your individual lease. So I think you know if you have an attorney happy. Feel free to send something something my way if you want me to take a look at it. Uh, but all that to say is force majeure, the general concept, I understand that, but it's just it varies per per lease. And on top of that, in order to exercise force majeure, you need to go to court. A court has to say, hey, yes, you qualify and your, your obligations were in fact suspended. Courts are closed. So how do you get there's nothing to 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 to, to uh, give you that ruling at this time. So it's, it's a legal argument that you will argue in court to try to get remedies and rights under. But the problem with the landlords have with evictions, the same problem that tenants have, there's no court hearing that at this time, uh, only afterwards. So at this point, which is what go back to date, the, the point one is to communicate and not have to go to court to try to exercise these rights. And hopefully private parties can work it out. But if they don't, then yes, you have an argument to force the majority to the extent it's present in your lease and it suspends your rent and also it covers um, things like a pandemic or things of that nature. So everything is on a case by case basis. And uh, I hate to give answers that says it depends, but for force majeure, it really does depend what's in your lease. Okay. And I just want to add really, really quickly on force majeure. I think there are going to be a whole spate of lawsuits because businesses are definitely pressing their insurance companies for loss of business coverage and the insurance companies are claiming force majeure. It's a little bit unclear whether the government requiring you to close your business, even though there's not an imminent you know, terrorist attack or, or chemical spill right by your site, is that force majeure. Um, so I think there there's going to be in the coming weeks and months, a lot of pressure on the insurance industry to be, um, whether they're artificially supported to make these payments to business or what happens, but there right. might be a shakeout under force majeure with the insurance industry. Yeah, uh, Del Del, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna bring Blake in to help us answer the next couple of questions. Okay. Uh, we'll 
Right. Can I just add one thing that I think so often entrepreneurs, their first thing, uh, one of the first things that you're taught or that you instantly just even know is to save your cash. I think that this is one of those situations where save as much cash as you can, because the reality is you can't come to a, an agreement with someone that you owe money to um, and they take you to court. If you have that cash on hand the moment you're in court, in some ways that saves you. So save as much cash as you can, do as much partnering as you can, try to be as creative as you can, because these are the moments where you have to rely on the fact that that, that cash might end up saving you a, in a pinch. You. So um, just keep that in mind. Second. Let me bring Blake in. And while we're bringing Blake in, and uh, he's connecting. There you go. Hey, Blake. Hello. Hello. Welcome back. So right now, the the question is, uh, some landlords are offered forbearance, and some uh, landlords or entrepreneurs are inclined to offer a promissory note on the rent is due accruing uh, as the time goes by. Uh, I would like to hear uh, all of your perspective and the best advice for these entrepreneurs and the best way to handle it, right? Because in some instances, I imagine if you are growing rent but zero revenue, uh, that's just a, a snowballing and you never know when you're going to come out of, out of that. So, uh, Blake, have you heard anything from uh, your clients that dealing with that and what kind of solutions are coming with? Are you, are, are you talking about the question, Juan, about personal guarantees as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll along the way, yeah. Yeah, personal, I mean, personal guarantees, uh, I, I would be very, very, uh, uh, I'd say no right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's uh, uh, because they can come out. I mean, even though the, the litigation side of things, and Aaron, you can comment on this, is going to be as long and tenuous, and then it's going to put a little, going to put a lean on on those, you know, property owner space if, if they're going after you. But I, I'd say no. I mean, it's just it, that that opens up a whole other. Uh, and and by the way, post recession, the Great Recession, there was a, a ton of uh, personal guarantees, especially for entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, moving forward, and I think you guys had mentioned it. I mean, moving forward, the force majeure clauses, I think, are going to you're going to start getting a lot of additions uh, to new leases coming out that, that take that into effect. Same thing with it, with certificates of insurance. You're going to start getting a lot of uh, experience teaches us, and so you're going to start getting a lot of those things added to it. Um, so I would say no, no on the on the personal guarantee side of things. It's just it's way too much exposure. What I what I what I want to also bring up too is what we're learning. I think from an entrepreneur perspective, and some of these businesses is is some are run on such thin margin, and I think it's important to consider too when we're talking about communication with with landlords. Um, uh, I think sometimes the, the thought is that just because you own an asset, you own a building, all of a sudden you're some wealthy landlord. I think that might be the case in some in, in some instances, but it is important that you know a lot of those uh, a lot of the the ability for owners to own those assets are you as a tenant. Um, that's how they pay their you know they, they pay their their mortgage. So it's it's working together and figuring out. Uh, I think Aaron, you had mentioned it. If someone tries to evict you after 90 days, uh, they're going to have another nine months to piece out the space and come back in to reoccupy that. Like you said, it's just the cost to do that. If you run a just a quick analysis on that, you don't even have to put it in a spreadsheet. I mean, it's just quick basic math on what it's going to cost to list the space, the the loss of income you're going to get for the vacancy, the cost you're going to have to do to, to list it with a broker. The cost you're gonna have to put the capital improvements in there. Right. Then, you know, the abatement that you're gonna have to because the market's gonna be down. So there's there's so many waterfalls to that. Um, so uh, I a, go ahead, Michelle. I, I have a couple of add-ons to that. Um, so one of the reasons I like to go month by month is if you say to a landlord, like, you know, again, you don't want to freak them out about the long term and everyone, we're, you know, it's like every day we have a new story. So I think going, uh, you know, like I keep repeating that um, month by month, I would say for a small business, I would 100% try to avoid anything that locks you down to a payment plan or future payment rent because we know so little right now. So if you're gonna propose something concrete, my first choice is to just ask for an abatement next month. My second choice is to say, let's ask for an abatement next month 
And if you have five years left on your lease, you can say, let's amortize that out over the entire lease so that it's a very tiny payment that gets added on. Um, if you have only a year left on your lease, you know, then I would think about it. The third thing that I might ask for if your landlord says no is say, well, can we increase the length of our lease by one month and just add that rent onto the month yeah. so that the value of the lease overall as a, a unit that can be securitized is still the same value. Um, so those are the things that I would all ask for first before agreeing to a pretty tight repayment plan. I have a lot of small businesses that have been asked by their landlords to agree to right now um, a three month half rent deferral and then they're supposed to pay rent and cams which are significant and then they're supposed to in the three months after that pay their regular rent plus make up the rent from before. Um, so they're really gonna be paying, and, and anybody who's on a three to six month timeline to repay their rent as soon as things open up are gonna be paying one and a half to two times rent. I don't know a single person that is projecting yeah. sales when things open back up to be at 2019 levels. So if you agree to that, you're agreeing to paying twice as much rent with maybe half as much sales which does not make a lot of sense. And so I'm really trying to keep people away from agreeing to short-term amortization schedules of repayment of rent. And I'm also trying to get people away from, um, you know, trying to project out and agree to things over the next three to six months because it's just so unpredictable what we're going to be looking at. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. I, you know, it's a tough conversation to have but I, I, you know, and, and because you're, people are generally good people, you want to meet people in the middle. You may feel bad for your landlord and uh, want to do something, commit to something. But at the end of the day is, you know, at this point, it's about self-preservation of your, your enterprise and your business. And I wouldn't commit, honestly, to anything. Um, just say, look, I acknowledge you, the bill is owed. I understand the obligation of the lease. I'm not trying to, you know, stiff you over or anything like that. But I can't give you any type of promises or commitment because I have no expectations or no type of, I can't anticip anticipate anything in the future for myself. So I understand the bill is due, but you know, once things open up, then we, I, I'm happy to explore a conversation on how to get this bill paid. Um, but as far as committing to anything, it's just impossible to do it. Because once, like you said, once the, even when things somewhat return to normal, there's no guarantee of demand. There's no guarantee of business. Uh, things will start to trickle in hopefully, but you don't know what that's going to be like. Uh, so as I'm saying, in addition to things that, that were just pointed out, um, to the extent you were in a retail business, to percentage rent type of uh, arrangement um, for temporary uh, point in time, uh, I've seen that. I've seen things or amortizing it or things of that nature. Or I've seen just some tenants just saying, look, I, this, I can't give you anything. Um, and I can't promise you anything. And we'll deal with this when things open up. And it's a tough conversation to ask because you may feel like a jerk, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's absolutely spot on. You, you can't anticipate what's going to happen. You don't know how things are going to open up and it's tough for you to promise something and you're not in the ability to, to guarantee or predict anything. Um, I definitely would not do uh, any type of guarantee or anything like that. You don't need a promissory note. The, the lease is the note effectively that you already signed. So we know that the bill is due. Um, so you don't need to sign any additional paperwork or anything like that. It's just a matter of, you know, being open with your landlord, you know, be responsive when the landlord uh, reaches out to you and put pressure on you, but stand your ground as far as, you know, I can't, it's, it's just impossible in this market, in this environment to guarantee or make a commitment for anything when we have, z we have absolutely zero clue of how things are going to roll out uh, or, or anything like that. So it's a tough conversation to have, um, you know, be courteous, be nice, but then at the same time, stand your ground at the same time because uh, you're making promises that you really can't guarantee. Uh, Sarah is asking, uh, she's getting feedback from landlords that paying something means a lot uh, until they're trying to figure out how they're going to deal with this. What are your thoughts around that? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. We'll move on that one. Mitchell? There are kind of two things here. Uh, that's totally awesomely dad life. Um, my my kids are 21 and 18 now, so we're like I'm on a panel virtually that you know I can like send them a text to bring me tea um, <laughs> instead of having them walk into the room. So um, I, I think I'm, now, Juan, what was the question? Sorry, I got distracted. 
Uh, yeah, some landlords are saying paint something uh, mid uh, it, it could mean a lot, right? They're trying to right. they're trying to assess, assess the losses, and while they figure out what is the next step for them, uh, they will appreciate it if some sort of goodwill and paint some rent uh, could go a long way. Let me read. Yeah, so the first thing I want to do is I want to read a quote from a small tenant uh, whose landlord was, you know, I just finished a building, over leveraged and uh, probably in trouble. Because if you just finished a building in the last year or two, uh, you're going to be in financial trouble unless your dad is Bill Gates. So um, here's what this tenant wrote. I'm frustrated. My landlord doesn't seem to think that he, it will ever cost him a cent. He'll get his money, but later and interest free, despite the fact that I won't get my money later. I'm on food stamps and he's got multiple homes. I'm the biggest paying tenant, but somehow I have the burden of feeding my kid and also his. And, and so the reason that I like that email, uh, you know, um, uh, like is maybe not the right word. The reason that email is important is because we all need to step back and look at the situations that we're in. So I'm a small landlord. I own a small building and I have a tenant in that building. And we just proactively went to our tenant when they started and said, this is going to be terrible. We're going to abate rent next month and we're going to take it month by month and we're going to figure out uh, the financing on the back end. Um, and, and we have the wherewithal to do that. Um, but the reality is, is that a property owner, yes, they would like some sort of payment, but somebody who owns investment property is by definition in a much better financial situation generally than somebody who owns a small business whose sales have gone to zero. And I really think that it's important that we not create this false equivalency between somebody losing all their income personally, all of their businesses income and being on default and everything overnight because of an action of the government and somebody who owns a lot of investment property and multiple properties and has a lot more financial resources, those are not the same things. And when we have situations where landlords are behaving badly, um, I am seeing landlords equating these situations in the same way. So I have small tenants who are having a hard time paying the bills and buying groceries, um, and their landlords are, say, landlords are saying, you know, boo-hoo for me, I might lose my beach house. So if I lose my building, that's going to suck. I totally will not be happy about that. But that is not the same thing as somebody being able to support themselves, to stay housed, and, and to be able to eat. So I think it's really Im important that we not go too overboard on, um, you know, who shoulders the cost of this. So the way that I put it, and we just got out of our commercial eviction COVID task force meeting uh, that the mayor and the city convened, and, and we had this discussion. So the reality is, is that this stoppage has taken trillions of dollars out of the economy permanently. It is not coming back for anybody. And so in the commercial real estate uh, ecosystem, that means we have business owners impacted, property owners impacted, and we have uh, lenders impacted. And so as far as I'm concerned, the people who should bear the largest blunt of that chunk of money that's not coming back are going to be lenders. And then the next group are going to be property owners. And I include myself in that because people with more need to step up right now. And then the last group that should shoulder this burden are small businesses. And I'll tell you what, our system traditionally pushes it all off on small businesses. So yes, if you are making some money, then do some sort of small percentage rent uh, payment to your landlord. But if your sales have gone to nothing and you've had to lay everyone off and you personally have no income right now, I do not think you should feel remotely bad about saying, I cannot pay rent. You should not be dipping yeah. into your savings it, to pay rent to your landlord. Yep, yep. I, just to piggyback on top of that, you're, you're absolutely spot on. And I, I'm a very small uh, property owner as well. And you're right. It's we it's folks that are the commercial landlords to lend. They have more resources, and, and best believe, you know, the landlord, you know, they they are already probably pushing back on their lender to restructure their deal, structure their loan to get more time, which should understandably, uh, you would think would pass through to the tenant. So everyone has to, you know, expo you know, kind of exploit their resources to to try to help out here. The landlord has insurance. They have, you know, I, I think I don't know if we already mentioned it, but sure, the tenant has business interruption insurance, but the landlord most likely has rental loss insurance that they can tap. Um, they can restructure their deal uh, with the with their lender. I mean, some landlords can even apply for a small business loan. You know, if you have employees, they can get funds that way. Um, so it's it's a number of resources that the landlord has, and at the end of the day. 
YSL ten is not to feel bad. I mean, obviously you want your bu- you, you want to you know comply with all your obligations, but the landlord is in business of renting to tenants, and there's a risk of, of of tenants not paying. That's the risk you take on by being a landlord, and you're supposed to save the necessary amount of vacancy reserves, all these type of reserves to protect yourself in the event that your business doesn't work out. The same pressures that the tenants are facing in their respective businesses, the landlord their sole business is to lease to tenants. And if a risk occurs and a risk happens, which is the business of being a tenant, guess what? You need to have reserves as well. So we can't push all this pressure down. The landlord should have necessary reserves in case this happens, have insurance in case this happens. So all that to say is to relieve some of the pressure that may be, may be being placed on tenants of having to try to figure something out when this is the landlord's business. The tenant is not in the business of renting. That just happens to be part of their business to open up their business. The landlord is effectively 100% in the business of leasing. And this is the risk that comes with leasing. They should be prepared as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's all, there's, there's part of this too is, is uh, a concept that we've been sort of talking about since the CARES Act came out. You know, some of these buildings might be owned in LLCs or partnerships. And so, and those might be classified as small businesses. So, you know, what's the transparency on double dipping from the landlord perspective, right? They right. go and get business interrupted, you think lost insurance, et cetera. And so I think I, I think there's also I mean I I certainly I come from the the angle of solely representing occupiers and tenants but I think from a community perspective and our industry perspective it's important for us to also educate our counterparts that are rep, that represent landlords too they they need to be having the same conversations with their ownerships and having those discussions right like letting helping them understand just like we would do is you know what's the cost to, to re-tenant or that there's a trend if there's a transparency on the tenant side there's got to be a transparency on the ownership side too yep. feel free to ask them the questions what are you guys doing as a landlord are you reaching out to your lender are you reaching out to, to your insurance provider do you, do you have you know rent loss insurance ask them the questions and and reach out to your partners they yeah have partners as well you know do a capital call you have access to capital when things happen capital you have partners you have investors you have all, all up the chain it should yep. always come down to the tenant Yep. Yep. It's important to make sure that, that, you know, then I think, I think Aaron, you mentioned it earlier about building your case, right? Like, you know, you're sending them emails, you're sending them emails, you're putting calls, so you're documenting that. Right. And so as you're also from a documentation perspective, if you're, if you're asking them these questions and you're getting, a, you know, answers, um, you know, hopefully there's, there's some truth to those answers. Right. And hopefully you get back from them. Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to do everything we can too. I mean, there's going to be, there's going to be bad apples in every, you know, in every orchard. And so I think that there's, we're just going to have to, everything's going to continue to be case by case. Um, you know, there, there's large mall landlords across the country. I just read this morning that Taubman, which is going to be acquired by Simon Property Group. I mean, we're talking billion dollar landlords here, yeah. but them too. I mean, you know, they, they've got, they're, they're driving into their tenants and it's the same, you know, um, and then you've got other landlords like Irvine Company, major landlord down in Southern California that basically, you know, practically went there to their tenants and said, Hey, like, you know, um, next three months are going to be, you know, are, I don't know if it's going to be a deferral or whatever, but it was a proactive approach to let their tenants know we're open to the conversation versus this door is closed. Yeah. And that's a great advice. And we can keep going. This, but, but I would say, yes. I would say there's an art, you know, but I would say yeah. tenants shouldn't go and, and make accusations. Correct. Right. You know, there's yep. an art of communication, you know, art yep. of trying to, you know, get something their way, but don't, don't put in the email, you know, talk to your partners and your lender art to it, but yep. just know that if the tenant is unable to pay, is unable, unable to pay, the landlord does have resources yeah. to get through this. So don't feel bad. If you, you don't have it, you don't have it. It's nothing you can do. But the landlord I, does have resources. And I would yeah. say one, one last piece to that uh, in, in terms of, you know, surrounding yourself with, with people that can help on your side, you know, there is, there, there's an art to it. There's a way to massage communication. There's a yeah. way to, to approach. And if you're, if you as a business owner, you're really good at doing your, your piece, there's sort of a division of labor. If you need some advice on certain things, whether it's, a, a, you know, a, an attorney or whether it's a, a advisor, a broker or, or whatever insurance provider, I mean, make sure you have people around you that you trust and you can ask these questions and you're not worried about getting the bill back for it. I mean, that, I just, speak, I'm not speaking for you, Aaron, but I'm just thinking like in our world, like there's a lot of questions. Most of the questions that I've been feeling in the last three and a half weeks have been all around this, not yeah. deal flow, yeah. not, Hey, we're going to do a 10 year deal and all this other stuff. It's do I need to pay rent? Yeah. How do I have a conversation? Would you mind opening up a conversation with the landlord on my, on my behalf? How can we get through this? What are the, what, 
you know, what tactics can we take? What strategy can we employ? Yep. And, and the last thing I would just add is let's look at how many national tenants are publicly declaring, I'm not paying rent. Yeah. Whether, yeah, the yeah. So, the cheese so take a boost. Boys, yeah. Right. So the big boys are like, yes. Yeah, so by the way, we're just announcing it in the newspaper that uh, we're not paying rent. So clearly that's, you know, this is an issue. And uh, it's one everyone's going to have to deal with. Yeah. And I know we can keep going. And I appreciate the, the, the live conversation. And I'm sure that is going to be a lot of follow up after the call. So I want to bring Del Del back. But before I do that, uh, can Aaron, can you give us each one of you can give us one uh, piece of advice that uh, you will part away with people to think about they can do uh, and be actionable, for, they can start doing tomorrow. And Aaron, we'll start with you a piece of advice. And then I will thank you for your time. And I will bring Del Del back that way she can give us her parting words. Thank you. Oh, actually, Aaron froze. <laughs> OK, uh, we'll start with you, Blake. Uh, one piece of advice you want to give people. Oh, oh go ahead, Aaron. Go oh, ahead. you can't hear me. OK. Um, yeah, yeah I, I would say from the from the beginning, um, you know, I, we keep drumming the same beat, but it's, it, it's so important as far as communication, being honest, uh, honest op and, and not committing to, m to more than what you can do. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's a difficult times for everyone. Um, so even though that can be troubling, but to, this, to some extent, it could be comforting to know that everyone's going through it. We have to all figure this out together. We're all in this together. Um, and, and that to some extent that you just know when you're not alone in this, there could, could be some comfort. Whether, so whether you're communicating with your landlord, you communicate with other tenants, communicating with folks here on the chat, um, just reaching out to folks to figure out what's your support, what's your resources that you have, the remedies that you have, it starts there. Uh, and then the other thing was, you know, this, even though it's tough to see right now, but this too shall pass. You know, we, we've been through a, a ton. It's gonna be an adjustment, obviously, uh, but we've been through a lot just as a, as a community and as a, as a country. And, you know, it's gonna be some trying times, but this will eventually pass. And, you know, look forward to being on the other side of this. Aaron, thank you for your time from Perkins Coie. Uh, I'm gonna bring it. Del, Del feel free back. to reach out. Um, I, I'm on Twitter. I'm, I'm on. I can give you my email. I can put it down here. Feel free to reach out to me. This means a lot to me. Um, help, happy to help, or just you know, be a sounding board for folks if folks need uh, assistance. I'll put my email down in the chat here, and you can also find me on Twitter as well. Thank you, Aaron. And thank I'll you. bring Del Del in a moment. Uh, while we do that, uh, Blake, what is your piece of advice for? Yeah. I I think a uh, big piece is don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, I think it's for entrepreneurs and, and people that uh, are, are uh, sort of leader, leaders, whether it's their organization or otherwise, uh, I think sometimes we think that we have it all together. So I think it's important that not don't be afraid to ask for help. You're asking for help for your landlord. You're asking for help around, you know, your sort of internal board of directors around you, whether that be, like I said before, an attorney, a broker, an insurance person uh you know financial you know advisor just don't be afraid to ask for for help thank you uh del del you you've been uh chatting and and the chat comments the last uh one thing that people can do today and start getting ahead of this i think you audio is not there del -del. Oh, you're on mute there you go. That. There you go. Um, I was just saying what Blake said is deeply important to ask for help, but also offer help to be able to have that exchange. Uh, if you have never been great with QuickBooks or accounting, this is the moment where you can go to the accountant and say, hey, you know what my expertise is? Let's do an exchange. Um, help me figure out where my money has traditionally come from, how I can reapportion things, how I can be thinking about things. I think this is the moment where we have to double down on each other um, because uh, one of the comments uh, here was, we don't know what's gonna happen. That The reality is nobody prognosticated the effects of this um, and we do not know the effects of what's gonna happen. I saw this great exhibit a couple months ago about the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and in some ways it was very helpful, but the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic change this world. It changed it completely. Everything from women's rights and the right to vote, 
uh, black folks' ability to be full citizens in this country, everything that you think of, suburbia as we know it, transportation as we know it, radically changed because of the pandemic. Uh, between World War I and the pandemic, the world changed as we know it. And that's what the 20th, 20th century became. And I really want to say that while it is difficult and painful and folks around us are in pain and are sick and we're all dealing with these things, the reality is, is that we have to think about our futures will be drastically different and we should find hope amongst ourselves because it's gonna depend upon our own ability to be creative and interested in each other. That's really gonna help us move on from this moment. Um, and I just, that's the thing that helps me sleep at night uh, is to be able to engage in conversations with brilliant people like you all who understand what some of the details are. But I do wanna uplift and say, sometimes you just gotta offer and ask. And it's as simple as that. Thank you, Daldel. Uh, Michelle, uh, your piece of advice before we wrap up. So my, uh, you know, um, it won't be a surprise, it's a compound piece of advice. Um, so it's about communication. So I want you to get everything in writing. If you have a fun conversation, just quick follow up friendly note saying, great to talk to you. Thanks for blah, blah, blah. Get it all in writing. I don't want you to be emotional. I want you to be reasonable. If you need someone else to read that email for you to make sure you're, you're not pissed, then have someone else read that email. Um, I want you to write everything as if a judge or an arbitrator is reading it later because a judge or an arbitrator may be reading this later. So everything you write should be through that lens. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You're gonna be doing this lots more times and you're gonna have to be able to compartmentalize like a doctor, right? He goes in, life or death surgery, and is able to come home. And so, so all of these communications are gonna be stressful. It's not a part, you know, getting in there and rough and tumble negotiating and dealing with really um, weighty financial topics is not part of most people's day-to-day -day work. So you're gonna have to figure out how to compartmentalize, have that be over here, and then speaking to that kind of emotional health, be able to let that go and, and kind of move on. So just kind of a body of things to think about around communication. All right. Well, I want to say thank you, uh, Aaron uh, from Perkins Coie, Michelle for Civilis Consultant, Blake from Crisa Real Estate, and Delta for Black and Brown Founders. Thank you so much for putting uh, the can you time this afternoon to answer questions to everybody. Uh, just a reminder, at 5 o'clock, uh, Rick Duroxy will be jumping into uh, Pi, uh, question and answers. Uh, for any founder that wants to, to talk to Rick, uh, we all need a, a little dosis of Rick every now and then on a daily basis. Um, now that we cannot see him in person, we get to see him virtually. And um, Bill Oregon will be announcing the next the next team um, uh, for next week. Um, we continue rolling uh, at some percentage times. And the best effort uh, that we can do is help each other out. We came out of, out of this uh, better, stronger as a community, as individuals. Stay healthy and thank everybody. Thanks, Juan. Thanks, Bill Oregon. Appreciate it. Thank you.